What's up guys, I'm Justin Burkholtz and it's time for another book review. Today I'm going to be reviewing The Phenomenon of Man by Pierre Thieler de Chardin. And this is an absolutely incredible book which was voted the best spiritual book of the 20th century even though when it was originally published it earned scathing critiques from the scientific community and censorship from the Catholic Church. So it's a very interesting story, super interesting book. Stick around for the review. And if you like this kind of content, uh, make sure to hit subscribe and consider supporting me on Patreon or with a one-time donation. Those links can be found below. All right, so if you've seen my other reviews, uh, you probably know by now that some of my favorite books kind of bridge the divide between science and religion or science and spirituality or spiritual practices. The reason for that is that I think there is a really fruitful area to be explored there that just hasn't been deeply explored enough because when we initially kind of divided uh, science from spirituality and spiritual pursuit, uh, we kind of chose not to turn that specific lens uh, back on to religion and spirituality for a very long time. Now in the 20th century, maybe mid 20th century on, that kind of research has begun. But this book, The Phenomenon of Man, was written right before that. Um, so this came out in the very uh, early 1960s, and it was actually right after uh, the author Pierre had actually passed. Uh, during his life, he was kind of held back from publishing a lot of his works because of his role as a Jesuit priest. Um, but he was also a paleontologist who made several uh, really uh, kind of groundbreaking um, paleontological finds during his life as well. And he was a very um, well-trained and uh, well-respected uh, scientist in his own way, as well as philosopher and theologian. So The Phenomenon of Man is a really interesting and unique book because it kind of really spans um, the genres of uh, science and evolutionary uh, biology, philosophy, and theology. And as a trained paleontologist, philosopher, and Jesuit priest, uh, Pierre was kind of uniquely qualified to write such a work. Now, it may sound a little shocking to you to hear about a book about evolutionary biology written by a Christian priest uh, in our time, in our lifetime here. Um, a lot of people have this idea that for some reason, uh, evolution and religion are completely incompatible and you can't possibly believe in both or understand evolution and also have religious uh, beliefs and practices, which I've always found really strange. Uh, Pierre definitely uh, is on the complete opposite side of the spectrum when it comes to his beliefs about evolution and Christianity. In fact, his conclusion in the book, a lot of people today I think would still find shocking. What he states is that uh, rather than reducing uh, religion and Christianity to irrelevance, evolution actually can uh, revitalize it and uh, infuse new blood uh, into it. And so this is what he states, and I quote, Though frightened for a moment by evolution, the Christian now perceives that what it offers him is nothing but a magnificent means of feeling more at one with God and of giving himself more to him. In a pluralistic and static nature, the universal domination of Christ could, strictly speaking, still be regarded as an extrinsic and superimposed power. In a spiritually converging world, this Christic energy acquires an urgency and intensity of another order altogether. If the world is convergent, and if Christ occupies its center, then the Christogenesis of St. Paul and St. John is nothing else and nothing less than the extension, both awaited and unhoped for, of that noogenesis in which cosmogenesis, as regards our experience, culminates. Christ invests himself organically 
with the very majesty of his creation. And it is in no way metaphorical to say that man finds himself capable of experiencing and discovering his God in the whole length, breadth, and depth of the world in movement. To be able to say literally to God that one loves him not only with all one's body, all one's heart, and all one's soul, but with every fiber of the unifying universe. Evolution has come to infuse new blood, so to speak, into the perspectives and aspirations of Christianity. Now, as a Christian who has long been baffled by other Christians' inability to reconcile their faith with the facts of evolution, this really appealed to me um, greatly. However, it wasn't exactly well received at the time. His opinions pretty much outraged the scientific community. Um, not all of them. There were some like Julian Huxley who stood by him and kind of understood uh, what he was doing. Uh, but it also earned him censorship from the Catholic Church as well. Back in the 1960s. In the later part of the 20th century, in the 90s and uh, 2000s and onward, uh, his work has actually been much more uh, well received by both religious establishment, uh, receiving specific praise from uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, and he has been cited as prophetic and profound in secular um, publications such as Wired magazine and in Jamie Wheel's incredible book *Recapture the Rapture*, which draws a lot on uh, Pierre's philosophy. Now, this pushback is totally understandable uh, from my uh, perspective. You know, anyone trying to write a philosophy that ties together evolution into Christianity is obviously going to face a lot of criticism uh, from both uh, domains, from the scientific uh, domain and the religious. A lot of people want to keep those things entirely separate for some reason that I don't understand. Uh, personally, I think the most beautiful insights into uh, nature and into meaning and our own purpose uh, come from the combination or the conversation between those two. But nevertheless, Pierre was a little bit ahead of his time and people just didn't really like what he had to say at the time. Now, his book begins by giving a detailed account of what was known about the history of the universe and the evolution of life on Earth uh, at the time. This was, once again, written in like the 1950s. So there have been further discoveries since then. But even so, he traces all of the uh, patterns, the trends, the critical uh, points of transformation throughout life's history. And then he shows how, if we were to follow those trends and project them into the future, how we can see where evolution might be going, especially the evolution of mankind and our consciousness. Pierre argues that evolution, having found a suitable form in man to uh, produce the capability of self-reflection and the sort of consciousness that we possess, has now turned its full power uh, into evolving consciousness itself, and specifically a kind of collective uh, consciousness, which he calls the noosphere. And so this collective consciousness, he is one of the reasons why people see him as a sort of prophet for the modern age, where we are all connected with the World Wide Web. He sort of uh, envisioned that this would be the next uh, step in the evolution of consciousness. And he sees this all as culminating in something that he calls Omega, or the Omega Point, which is going to be the next critical transformation point in the uh, you know, course of evolution. And this is kind of a, a teleological uh, vision that he has. He sees the Omega Point as the culmination and the end and the aim of the universe, of life, of uh, everything that has occurred up till now. 
And so he sees this omega point as a sort of supreme super consciousness in which all individual consciousnesses will remain their individual uh, personality and personhood and will commune together in a sort of unity in which each person will remain conscious of themselves while also being part of a greater whole. And another quote, he says, in any domain, whether it be the cells of a body, the members of a society, or the elements of a spiritual synthesis, union differentiates. In every organized whole, the parts perfect themselves and fulfill themselves. And this is a philosophy that he specifically contrasts with other forms of pantheism. He says, through neglect of this universal rule, many a system of pantheism has led us astray to the cult of the great all in which individuals were supposed to be merged like a drop in the ocean or like dissolving grain of salt. And so he says that unlike this uh, idea that has been proposed in uh, Buddhism and Vedanta and Hinduism that we are going to kind of dissolve into a kind of uh, yeah, indistinct non-personal uh, form a collective consciousness at the end of time he states that is going to be a communion of individual persons communing as a part of a greater whole and so he says that instead of uh, getting rid of the ego and the personality and the, the personhood our goal should be actually to evolve our personhood to a sort of hyper personalization which is the term that he uses this is one of the ways in which he stands out from other philosophers who propose other forms of teleological unity. For Tillard, the great reunification of consciousness at the end of time is not one in which we lose our sense of self, our personality, and our uniqueness. If that were the case, he argues, we wouldn't have developed such things in the first place. Rather, like I said, he envisions it as a kind of hyper-personalization. So this was a really incredibly profound book which reshapes what it means to be human and places us firmly within and at the center of nature rather than some kind of separate and apart uh, existence in competition with the rest of nature. Not only that, but he shows how a deep understanding of evolution can revitalize our spiritual life rather than rendering it irrelevant. Similar to many of the other books I've reviewed, The Phenomenon of Man proves that science and religion can come together to produce meaningful and valuable insights which both further our understanding of the world around us and deepen our sense of meaning and connection. I do have to admit that it was somewhat difficult to read, especially in the beginning. The language is a little strange. It is translated from the French and he uses a lot of very unique um, words. He has a very specific kind of vocabulary. But the way that it's written is very systematic and he goes through and defines each of the terms that he uses even if they are all going to be terms that you're not necessarily used to. Once you get into the hang of it you start to understand the way that he writes, the way that he presents his argument, and you can kind of follow uh, the through line through the argument and at the end it is really profound how it all wraps up and comes back together to support his conclusions. So I do think that it's not necessarily the most accessible book but it really is profound and uh, it is worth it to stick through it and get to the end to see how he draws the through line from the very beginning of matter all the way until the culmination of the uh, evolution of consciousness at the end of time. So I really enjoyed uh, reading The Phenomenon of Man even if it was a little bit difficult for me. The first few chapters I did get through very slowly um, but as I began to get into it I really was able to, to pick up speed and um, really enjoyed uh, the book a lot. He's been my most quoted um, philosopher or writer so far this year just because there's so many gems to be found. So 
If that's interesting uh, to you, I'll have a link below where you can pick up a copy for yourself. And if you like this video, please hit the like button, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and check out the other book reviews on my channel and see if there's something else you might enjoy. All right, well, thanks for watching.